All right, uh, thank you all for coming here. My name is Peter Robbins, and today I'll talk about LoRa reverse engineering and AES EM sidechain attacks using SDR. So if this kind of sounds like two subjects were mixed together and then presented in one talk, well, that's exactly what happened because uh, I actually submitted two talks and then the organization kindly allowed me to uh, mix them together. So I'm really happy about that and thank you very much. Um, so first, something about myself. I'm a PhD student at Hasselt University since 2014 and I'm mainly an InfoSec guy, so I research wireless security. Um, my job is to find uh, vulnerabilities in wireless protocols. Uh, I also did some work regarding uh, location tracking and fingerprinting. And as of lately, I added some machine learning and side channel analysis to that mix because that's, I mean, kind of what interests me. So I uh, always try to do that. Um, if you have a question or um, want to visit my website, here's the link. And we also have some time for questions at the end of this presentation. Um, so first of all, my motivation for uh, starting my research on LoRa started in 2016. So at that time, LoRa was a relatively new protocol and my co-advisor introduced me to it. I don't know how many people have heard about LoRa before. Okay, so a lot of people, <laughs> that's, that's very good. Um, so yeah, for those of you who don't know, it's basically just a low power, long range and low data rate uh, protocol for, designed for the Internet of Things. And um, because of this, there were, at that time, there were a lot of new opportunities to uh, learn new things. For example, there was no working software-based decoder available, uh, only some simulations, but they didn't really work with, um, with the effective hardware. Um, and then there was a second problem was that the description of the file layer was pretty limited. So there was this uh, one patent, which explains a lot of things about the modulation. And then some scattered blog posts. But really, to build a fully fledged decoder, you would have to do some reverse engineering as well. Um, and then there is the aspect of fingerprinting and tracking devices over long ranges, which is interesting. And it's an interesting problem we can tackle with LoRa. And finally, side channel attacks on I IoT protocols are interesting because uh, if you have, for example, a temperature sensor and you would deploy it somewhere, then obviously you will be more vulnerable to attackers that gain um, close range uh, uh, attack surface. So let's move on to part one, which is about unlocking the PHY. And with this, I mean just gaining access to uh, the file layer instead of just the Mac layer. Because if you would buy a LoRa device um, off the shelf, then the only interface you have is, is basically just um, over USB that you can program it. You can program it to send some Mac layer uh, messages. But that's all you get. So uh, we need to synchronize to the packets on the file layer. So where do we start? GNU Radio to the rescue, because we can just, uh, this is how you would usually start when reverse engineering uh, a protocol is just take your USRP and then dump it to file so you can analyze what the signal looks like. All right, and then you get something like this. Um, so here you can see an example LoRa frame. And in the beginning, uh, you see the standard stuff like a preamble, which is just all zeros. And so this one uh, little sawtooth wave is just um, uh, one symbol. And this repeats for a number of times. And then you have the frame sync and frequency sync. Um, which functions just to make sure that the receiver is synchronized in time and frequency to the transmitter. And then we have a header which basically um, encodes some information about the coding rate used, whether there is a CRC in the payload. And then we have the payload itself. And actually, in the case of LoRa, there can be some uh, symbols from the payload in the header as well. So this frame structure can be easily derived from uh, the patent. And here's the link if you're interested. It also contains information on how exactly they uh, encode data into this uh, format. Um, so the modulation and interleaving. Some other information is located in data sheets. For example, whitening and coding is not covered in the patent, but it's um, somewhat discussed in the white papers. So with that, let's start building a receiver. Now, usually the first step that you would do is detect the signal. And detecting is a pretty standard problem in signal processing, so you can choose really any algorithm that works for you. Uh, for me, I chose this algorithm, which uh, exploits the autocorrelation of um, a repeating preamble. So you just take the autocorrelation between these two, for example. And then you'll see that as um, the uh, symbols get more similar, uh, then you can see the metric rising and then it approaches one, for example. But now we want, still need to find out what the start is of a single symbol. So uh, I drew these red lines on the graph and those are drawn by myself. So 
Um, we still need to find where this position is exactly. And if you would threshold on this metric, then that would probably be a very bad approach because you would end up something uh, around here or around here, which is not ideal. So thresholding is bad. And to synchronize, again, you have multiple possibilities. Um, I saw some people that uh, demodulate the preamble symbol, which is supposed to be zero. And therefore, if you have an offset from zero, then that indicates a time shift, which is the basic principle of LoRa modulation. But in that case, you would have some amb ambiguity because there is, uh, if you have a frequency shift, then that will also cause an offset from zero. So what I chose to do instead is I just cross-correlate with the instantaneous frequency, and then you get a metric that looks like this. So uh, you locally generate a preamble yourself and then cross-correlate it, and it will be um, near or close to one at the start of the symbol. So with that, you can synchronize to single symbol. OK. Now, uh, the next question is, how do we demodulate a single symbol? So um, the modulation of LoRa is based on CSS, and it uses chirps. So a chirp is basically just a signal that linearly increases in frequency over time. So it starts at a negative frequency. Then you can see it increasing until it reaches 0. And then you can see the 0 here, and then it increases back. So to modulate a value i, for example, onto the chirp, what you would do is you would cyclically shift it. So uh, in this example, um, you can see the, sh the signal is shifted to the left, and this will result in um, something that looks like this. And for this example, the value is 20, but normally you wouldn't know that because the patent is very secretive about how this shift is really mapped to uh, a real value. But now we have seen how to modulate it, but how do we demodulate it? So you, when you receive a LoRa signal, you receive chirps that are already shifted. So uh, we need to do the reverse operation, and that can be done by uh, multiplying by the conjugate base chirp, so just the base chirp with the um, imaginary part uh, negated, and then resample at the chirp rate. And yeah, the details are not important, but it boils down to when you do that and you take the FFT, then you get a peak in the frequency domain where the modulated value should be. So, for example, for the preamble, which is always zero, the preamble symbols are always zero, so the uh, peak you will get is at index zero. Um, for the shifted symbol, um, there's something strange going on because you can see that it's not exactly 20, it's 24, and that's because this index is uh, what's called gray-coded. <coughs> okay, so after the demodulation, you have basically a list of chip values. Um, and now we need to do some other things to get to our ultimate data. Uh, the interleaving algorithm is described in the LoRa patent as well, and it's dependent on two uh, configurations. The first is the spreading factor, which determines the number of bits per symbol value. So here you can see the spreading factor in this direction. In this case, the spreading factor is 7. And then there is the coding rate, which determines how many symbols there are in the interleave matrix. So this should correspond to the uh, coding rate. So in this case, it's 8, since we use 4-8 coding. Um, so now, if you look at this matrix, what LoRa does, it essentially transposes this matrix and then walks through it in a diagonal fashion. So for example, for the last code word, you would just start here, then move upwards in a diagonal way. And when you reach the top, you just continue from the bottom. And this is pretty easy to implement in software. So you can just do this for the entire matrix, and you will end up with a list of deinterleaved code words. Now, as you may notice, the advantage of using this technique is that if you have, for example, this symbol right here, if it gets entirely corrupted, then it turns out that only the uh, third to last column of bits will be corrupted. And this can be corrected for since we use Hamming encoding, so we can just correct um, this code word. Now, what's left to be done? Um, so in the previous slides, I... Uh, told you guys that, there, that the uh, index is gray-coded. But how would you reverse engineer that? Because it's not uh, in the patent, or yeah, it mentions gray encoding, but it's not clear whether this is uh, which index uh, corresponds to which integer value. And also, at which stage of the decoding is whitening performed and how. That's uh, also something that's not known. There is some more to it. For example, the structure of the header that's used in LoRa, the clock drift correction, and then there's some weird stuff like LoRa appears to swap nibbles, which is something that GSM also does, if I'm correct. And it's uh, some weird CRC, so uh, but we, don't, we won't have the time to discuss that in this presentation. So, 
Um, anyway, on to the relation between the symbol and the integer value. So here we have our example again uh, with i equals 20 with a certain shift. And there are multiple ways to interpret this. For example, you could interpret the x-axis as is, so this is equal to 24. But then the question is, do we use gray encoding or gray decoding to uh, get the real value of i? And similarly, we can interpret the x-axis as inverted. So in that case, this would be 103, or we can do degray of 103. So to check for correctness, what we can do is we can implement the decoder up to the interleaving stage and then start looking for patterns. If there is uh, some pattern that doesn't match up with other payloads, then you know that there is something wrong uh, with your assumptions. So um, let's take a look at an example. So in the top left quadrants, I have printed out all headers uh, symbols when using right to left indexing, so 127 to 0, and uh, using gray encoding to get the value of the symbol. So I'm going to give you some time to look at this and let's see if you can figure out where the length is used. Here is um, the length that I, so this is something I added myself. This is just the length of the packet that I sent. So you should see some pattern that stays the same here and then increases here and again stays the same here and then increases in the lower nibble. And so uh, if you look closely, you can see that this pattern appears to emerge here because you have, this looks like zero and then it's one, two, three. And then you have here one and again zero, one, two. And the ones and the twos, they even correspond. But there's something strange going on because I said before that the header is not whitened and it appears to be that in this case, um, for example, a two is not equal to two, it's just all zero. So there's something really weird going on. And also, if you take a two from the highest nibble and go to the lower nibble, then you can see that they don't match. So that's not correct. Um, then let's go to gray decoding. Uh, in that case, it's even weirder because in this case, you'll have some bits that are um, added or, or removed. So this indicates that there's something really wrong with the previous layers of your decoder. So we can actually discard this whole column right here. And the right solution turns out to be left to right indexing and gray encoding. And in this case, you would get, like you would expect, expect that a zero is effectively zero as a Hamming code, and uh, it's consistent with the um, highest and lowest nibble. The only weird thing is that the order changes. So uh, first we had the length here, and now it appears in these two columns. All right. So now that we have reversed um, the interleaving and all the other aspects. There are still some two more aspects to reverse, and that's the coding. Uh, but since we use 4.5 coding and 4.8 coding as options, that's already a strong indication that probably Hamming coding is used. But uh, those of you who know about Hamming coding might notice something strange because the indexing doesn't really, or the, the indices of the bits don't really match up with standard Hamming coding. Um, and also, it turns out the payload is whitened, so that means XORT with a random uh, string, basically. And this is to make the data more uniform. They mention uh, the algorithm used for that in a data sheet, but this doesn't appear to work in practice. So uh, in that case, you need to answer another question, and that's in what stage is this data whitened? All right, so the fast solution for me was to just brute force uh, all possibilities for the whitening sequence. What you can do is you can just send a payload with all zeros, because if you XOR something with all zeros, then you just get the value itself. So in that case, when uh, the result of our payload is all zeros, we just end up with uh, getting the whitening sequence, uh, which we can store in an array and then use for uh, future packets. Now, if anyone has an idea of how to uh, do this more algebraically, uh, I would be happy to learn it, because uh, there is a library somewhere that um, seems to have an algorithm for uh, generating it algebraically, but uh, the, the whitening sequence doesn't really match up with my own. And also, if you try to decode, um, you get some weird values sometimes. So, um, And then there is Hamming code. So uh, as I said before, the bit indices are not equal to standard Hamming, so they are uh, permuted. And so we can just go over all possible permutations of a single byte, which is not that hard to calculate. So it's only uh, this amount of possibilities. And it was pretty e easy to brute force. All right, so now we have uh, all of the required components uh, linked together in order to build a fully functional decoder. So we have uh, discussed our preamble detection, sync, modulation, interleaving, whitening, coding, and then we have our uh, raw data. 
I have uh, implemented a decoder for this, and it's also open source on GitHub. If you want to check it out, feel free to do so. Uh, I made a comparison with the real hardware uh, for various number of payloads. And uh, as you can see, there is, uh, it's still uh, quite a lot worse, so there's still some work to be done. Um, for example, the real LoRa hardware is capable of uh, even decoding packets that go below the noise floor. So, um, whereas my because of, and that's because of the methods that I chose for the preamble sync and uh, or preamble detection and synchronization. So, there's still some uh, work to be done here. Uh, an advantage of my approach is that it's virtually um, um, not affected by frequency errors. So, and that's. Yeah, because of the gradient decoding that I implemented. But essentially, this allows you to decode multiple uh, channels at the same time, and that was useful for my research. Um, all right, so special thanks also to my student, William, for uh, implementing some optimizations. Uh, there are some other decoders out there, which uh, you should also check out. Uh, there's LoRa SDR, and then uh, Bastille Research is uh, GR LoRa. Uh, so uh, maybe they will work better for your use case uh, it all depends, I guess. And then uh, let's move on to doing something with the decoder. So let's go to our first application, which will be fingerprinting uh, LoRa devices using neural networks. Now you might wonder why would you want to fingerprint devices? And uh, what people usually uh, give us the uh, advantages in the defensive use case is, for example, an extra layer of defense for critical infrastructure. Suppose you have some kind of temperature sensor that sends highly important data. For example, you don't want an attacker to spoof uh, temperature readings and don't want to make it too hot in your house, for example. Then uh, you could use something like that to just check whether the fingerprint matches. Uh, also, what you can do is um, counter against relay attacks. For example, somebody wants to clone your car key signal and forward it somewhere else. You could perfectly detect that using a fingerprinting algorithm. Or you could just measure the degree of privacy provided by your uh, device. So how unique is your radio signal, essentially? And the offensive uh, use case is exactly the opposite. So um, you could use it to link anonymous transmissions. For example, people have used this before uh, in the case of MAC address randomization. So uh, even though the MAC address is randomized in that case, you can still go back to the physical layer and fingerprint devices on that level and still uh, and de-anonymize them based on the physical layer signal. So. And then there is tracking the location of sensors or uh, mimicking radio signatures. So that's the opposite of uh, providing this layer of defense. And so this is kind of a cat and mouse game because as an attacker, if you have knowledge of the algorithm that's used to fingerprint, you can probably uh, exploit this and craft uh, your own signal that more closely mimics the uh, signature of the radio device that you're trying to spoof. So it's uh, really a cat and mouse game between attacker and defender. Now, um, the theory of physical layer fingerprinting says essentially that um, no two radios can be perfectly identical. So when uh, a radio chip exits the, the factory, it will have some kind of variance between the crystal oscillator frequency, for example, the components. And these uh, small errors will manifest as transmission errors because, for example, if you have a, a faster crystal oscillator or a slower one, this will affect the uh, frequency offset of the device. Now, usually in data sheets, they have defined some tolerance for these values. For example, uh, in the case of LoRa, I believe you can have uh, 12 kilohertz of offset. So, um, and a larger tolerance also implies more entropy, of course, because the more you allow your devices to have different properties, the more uh, the probability is higher than you, that you can fingerprint them, of course. So the challenge here is to distinguish uh, these particular errors uh, caused by the radio hardware uh, from noise from the channel. Now, uh, traditionally, people have used um, what's what I like to call expert features. So people would just think about what would be useful uh, or, or useful features to use uh, to fingerprint a device. For example, they could think about, okay, what are the properties of Bluetooth? And for example, is the preamble transient of, of Bluetooth signals interesting? And then they would do some uh, human selection on these features and then uh, take some statistical measures, for example, the mean or variance, or just use some uh, SVM to train on this data. But what I su uh, suggested in my approach is that we simply use a machine learning algorithm to train on the raw radio signal. And this line of thought is similar to the computer vision world, where you have uh, similar techniques applied to face recognition and image classification. So uh, you can see an image as a 2D radio signal, essentially. And so what they do there is just take the raw pixels and use convolution filters and stuff like that to 
uh, come to the recognition of the face. And so this is similar to the objective of fingerprinting radios. To simplify this uh, comparison a little bit, uh, so here we have the raw radio signal, and this is what I would like to call then the human filtering. So you have, for example, somebody that decides, okay, we're going to take the FFT and then extract the mean of this uh, signal or the variance. However, what we can also do is uh, interpret the radio signal as the features themselves. So instead of these features, we just use the raw samples and then um, uh, forward propagate them through a neural network. And so the, the goal is that the uh, machine learning or the idea is that the machine learning algorithm will automatically uh, filter those unimportant features away through the weight values. So how would it work in practice? So we label our transmission with a certain uh, LoRa device. We feed the data through and then um, based on the weights and the biases, it will calculate a certain value, for example, here. So this is the predicted value and we will evaluate how accurate that um, result is compared to the true distribution. So in this case, the true distribution is that Y3 is a real LoRa device, while the machine learning algorithm predicts Y2. So we have to update the weights and biases and repeat this step in order to come closer to the real uh, distribution. Um, I've done this in an experiment where I have fingerprinted 22 LoRa devices um, from three different vendors. And um, to do so, I just, for example, for the next slide, I will show you a simple MLP, so a multi-layer perceptron, the one like this. And I used 100,000 symbols of training data, 1,000 symbols of test data. And this turns out to have 95% accuracy. However, and there is um, a strong nuance here because uh, this strongly depends on the um, atmospheric conditions in the room and also the channel. So you're uh, inadvertently also fingerprinting the channel a little bit, which um, makes it so that if you fingerprint a device in one room and then move to the other one, then uh, it won't work as reliably anymore. So, yeah, noise is a problem. And so here are the results. Uh, these are all the RN devices. These are the two RF devices, and this is the SX device. So you can even see that between vendors, there appears to be even more of a difference between the devices than uh, within a single vendor. So that was quite interesting for me to uh, see. By the way, what this, this uh, visualization shows is just the, all the output features uh, projected onto a 2D plane so you can easily uh, visualize what that looks like. All right, so now we've seen how to fingerprint a device and you could potentially track it down. So let's suppose that you want to track down your neighbor's temperature sensor again. And you not only want to track it, but you also want to know how hot is my neighbor actually? So you want to decrypt the messages that are sent out by the temperature sensor. And for that, we can use side channel attacks. Um, a side channel attack is basically an attack that exploits the fact that while your processor is doing some kind of computation, it leaks some information to the outside world through a side channel. So an attacker can gain advantage of that based on uh, this leaked information. And there are numerous types. For example, you have timing. Some uh, algorithms will take longer or slower, or some parts of algorithms will take longer or slower. You have acoustic, power consumption, temperature, cache, and those might even be uh, correlated. So you can use multiple side channels at the same time if you would want to. So um, yeah, so we're going to apply this on AES. And why AES? Because it's used in LoRa. It's used in Wi-Fi, TLS, IPsec a lot of apps also, so there's definitely a lot of potential. And the attack techniques that I'm about to present are nothing new um, by any means, but um, the thing is that they often require some expensive equipment, and I would like to show you guys how you can do it with a cheap SDR, for example. So how does the general attack methodology work? So as an attacker, you would first communicate with some kind of, for example, web service. You would send some data for the LoRa device to encrypt. The gateway will forward to the LoRa device, and the LoRa device will have to respond. So it will have to do an encryption. And by doing that, it will leak some information through the electromagnetic channel. And the attacker can then use this information, capture it, and then perform some analysis. Now, for doing this analysis, we need a model. And a model is basically just a way to uh, mathematically predict how that certain input to a chip will uh, result in a certain uh, electromagnetic radiation. And therefore, of course, the accuracy of the model is very crucial for a successful attack. How, uh, now, some observations that previous works have already made is that the amplitude of the EM radiation is proportional to the power. 
and that you need power to change the state of a circuit, of course, because you, if you change from a zero to a one or from a one to a zero, you need to uh, use some, some power. So that in turn makes it that state changes also cause variations in the electro electromagnetic radiation sent out by the device. Now, what would happen if we would AM demodulate uh, a AS encryptions? So what I'm about to show you now is an example where I did this for an Atmega 328P. Um, in this case, it was a device provided to me by a company called Riscure. They held uh, kind of a competition uh, to perform a side channel attack on a black box. So the key was absolutely not known to me. And uh, you had to find it out by doing a side channel attack. Now, looking at previous works, we can learn that lower frequencies must be favored. Apparently, there is more information than that. And then the harmonics of the CPU clock frequency also contain useful information. So now let's take a look at using a USRP, an amplifier, and an EM probe. So with this, I took about 18,000 uh, samples. And then you get something like this. Um, now, as you imagine, I was quite disappointed when I first saw this graph, because this just seems like random noise, right? So it is really no noisy. But after doing a low-pass filter, there's something more interesting going on. So um, here you can see there are some higher amplitudes here, then it goes back to a lower amplitude and back to a higher amplitude. So it almost seems like there's some power being drawn away here, and that's interesting. Also, if you look at the individual colors of the graph, you can see that there is a repeating pattern. So maybe if we use our trick from LoRa synchronization and apply it to this, maybe we can get a better result. And that turns out to be true, because if you align them, you can clearly see that there's something else going on. So um, here you can even see the different rounds of AS being executed. So here you can see round one, round two, round three, and so forth. So this highly suggests that there's a 10-round AS going on, so that means a 128-bit key. Now the next question is, where in this uh, graph here is the key effectively used? Because that's what we want to attack, right? We want to know the key of the AS encryption. And for that, we simply look at the specification of AES. So we have add round key here. And what it does is simply it takes a plain text byte and takes a key byte and XORs it, and that's the output. Um, now, what is a round key? Turns out that in the first round, so that's this sentence over here, in the first round, the round key is simply equal to the key of the user itself, so the cipher key. And that's uh, something you can exploit. After the add round key phase, it moves on to the sub bytes stage where, it will, where the output byte of the previous stage will just be substituted with another one based on the S box and it will store it again. So assume for now that the output of this is the vulnerable point that we want to attack. Now the question is what happens inside the chip? Um, so the initial state is unknown and let's call it R. And then after the add round key and sub bytes stages, the state will be D, which is equal to the S box of P, so the plain text XORed with the key. Now we also know that uh, in order to change from one state to another, we need to consume power. So therefore, we can just calculate what this power would be by taking the Hamming distance between R and D. So in this case, we have one, two, three, four. So we have Hamming distance of four. And uh, it turns out that in practice, the Hamming weight also works if R is equal to zero. So now that we have that, we can build our model for each possible key byte. So let's suppose that uh, our key byte is zero. We calculate our model and do this for every plain text that we transmitted. And then we repeat this process for every possible key byte. Next, we want to measure the reality. So we have our model already. Now it's time to measure uh, the reality. And for that, we need to look at the first part because it's the first, okay? because it's the first round where the key is used. Um, and then we can do correlation. So um, correlation is, a, is basically a way to find, well, yeah, a linear correlation. Pearson correlation is a way to find a linear correlation between two variables. So for example, we have our model here and our hypothesis here, and uh, we can correlate them in order to find the best model. So we want to find out which key uh, was our best guess. And here's the result. So um, for this, if you want to implement this attack yourself and found it a little bit um, too fast, um, I'm sorry for that, but yeah, we don't have a lot of time. And if you want to implement it yourself, what you can also do is just uh, use Chip Whisperer, which is um, open source uh, software that implements these uh, attacks. Usually it also comes with, um, uh, it's intended to be used with the commercial hardware of Chip Whisperer. But in fact, I wrote uh, a plugin for it so that you can use your own SDR uh, with Chip, Chip Whisperer. So. Uh, feel free to check it out. It's still 
uh, in beta. That's why I didn't upload it to GitHub yet because I still have to clean the code, but it works quite well. And um, I obtained these, uh, all these results with um, this plugin. And so here you can see that there is uh, a clear favoring of uh, one particular um, byte <coughs> of the key. And this is another visualization of that. So in the beginning, we have all of our models which have similar correlation. But then after including more and more traces, you filter more of the noise away. And you eventually end up with only one key byte that um, jumps out and is the real key used by the user. Unfortunately, uh, Chip Whisperer is um, uh, written completely in Python, and therefore it's uh, single source, uh, single core, if uh, I remember correctly. So uh, that's why I started implementing my own uh, framework for it called Emma. And with this framework, you can use multiple cores and run it on multiple machines as well. And so, as you can see, the result is exactly the same, but it takes only uh, 60 seconds to find a single byte of the key. And I hope to improve this further to include some other uh, techniques and algorithms um, in order to get the key faster or with less traces. Uh, to wrap this up, um, all of my finished research is uh, open source, so feel free to check it out. The decoder um, can be downloaded here. There is a VM with all of my fingerprinting experiments where you can uh, run them again. All the data was uh, captured to a MongoDB database, so you can play with it if you want. And then there is the chip whisper plugin, which you can also uh, download from this location. Some of the ideas that I had for my current research directions are to use this machine learning in order to create some kind of advantage. So maybe we can do some uh, other stuff that might uh, increase the correlation faster, for example, given uh, less amount of traces. Or maybe we can increase the range of these EM attacks to, for example, to go through walls uh, or something like that. So uh, if anyone has um, uh, wants to collaborate with me on that, feel free to contact me and then we can maybe work something out. Here are some other related papers which I found interesting about uh, fingerprinting and ch side channel attacks, so feel free to check them out as well. And then there are some nice examples that I found online from um, another university in uh, Israel. So uh, they, uh, what they did is they can fully extract the decryption keys by just holding a pita close to a laptop, so that was kind of cool. And the same for um, iOS devices, for example. I had prepared a demo and I tested it in the hallway and it's perfectly worked, but of course because the room here is changing and also because it's pretty sensitive to temperature, uh, the fingerprinting demo didn't really work anymore, but maybe I can train the machine learning algorithm again and then by the time we have the last session, maybe I can show it to you guys. Or you can just um, see me in the hallway and then we can try it over there. Um, and if there are any questions, then we have plenty of time for that now, I guess. Thank you. Sorry, I, I didn't understand your question. So the slide that you had with the squeeze me, where you, you put it in the chart, from a different limit, um, uh, were those temperature controls? This one, or? No, with the cheese me? With what? Fingerprint. TS. Ah, yeah, OK. Uh, I, uh, TS and E, yeah. No, those were, uh, yeah, actually I didn't explain that, so it's a very good question. Uh, so the question is what are, what are these uh, points? And they are just individual symbols of a uh, LoRa transmission. So um, I did the fingerprinting on a, si on a single uh, symbol. So what you're seeing here is the color corresponds to the device that sent the symbol. So in this case, um, if you have uh, a fully colored red one, that means that the prediction was correct. If you have the outline different, that it means that it thought that it was another device sending uh, the symbol. So, yeah. So, okay, sure. Uh, so, does that mean in certain cases lower encryption is broken? Uh, no, because this is, uh, so it doesn't mean that the encryption is broken. Um, this is only related to, um, so this is not related to the encryption at all, because this, what this does is just look at the raw radio signal and select a single symbol and just try to identify which was the transmitter of the lower device. And there's, it's really hard to, to counter that. Uh, I mean, even the encryption wouldn't help you there because yeah, the signature would still be the same because it's transmitted by the same hardware. So, yeah, it's just a...
It's like it's like um, meeting uh, someone in person and looking at his face, for example. I mean, it's just like humans uh, interact and, and identify each other. There is no encryption involved in that. Yes. Um, yeah, that's. So, how does the accuracy uh, improve with more symbols uh, fed into it? Um, well, the more data you have, the less um, yeah um, variance you will have. Essentially, so yeah, more data in machine learning is always better. So, um, the more data you can feed to your algorithm, the better it will work. Because, um, for example, when I train this model in my um, laboratory at the university, and then move it somewhere else, then it probably will not classify correctly anymore because the channel changed and maybe the temperature even changed so and because you are uh, because you have to um, measure such fine-grained errors those are manufacturing errors right so even temperature has an effect on these models so that means that um, in order to get a good model maybe you don't have to look at for example only the frequency but you have to incorporate other features as well so it's really a complex task of getting the right data for your model and then trying to get um, yeah, a, a good model for, for predicting which device is transmitting. And that's actually an active field of research right now where people are trying to figure out new ways to um, fingerprint devices. Yes, at the back. You used an inductive loop coupler on the NET Mega. Can you talk about the sampling rate or was it baseband electromagnetics or um, Okay, so what was the sampling rate used for uh, measuring this? Um, I don't remember exactly. I would have to check my notes again, but I think it was around uh, four mega samples per second. So. You can. The USRP will do that for you. So it's just a baseband signal that I analyzed. <laughs> what was the center frequency? Um, well, uh, I put the center frequency at about 64 megahertz, I believe. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit more about the synchronization you did for the AES? Uh... About what? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, about the synchronization of the AS signal. Um, so this one right here. Yeah. Uh, what I did here is I just took uh, one uh, trace as the reference, so one uh, filter trace, so with a low-pass filter already applied, and then I just did a cross-correlation and uh, cut off the signals at the right positions so that they would overlap in this region. You did not use the same algorithm as for the first research? Uh, sorry, I don't understand. You use the same algorithm as for the first research? Um, yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah. It's like the same algorithm as for LoRa synchronization, you mean? Uh, yeah, essentially, yes. But then um, instead of choosing a locally generated uh, preamble, I just used uh, one signal that was already available on, in the captures. Hey, one more question. For uh, visualizing this, or uh, the, the probe. Uh, the probe. Um, yeah, I don't remember the model number. Um, yeah, it's 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 a thing from Vietnam. Yeah, <laughs> but I don't remember. Do you know the model number? No, it's probably some old EV one. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. We're going to do a quick uh, air break.